Uh, okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the big 14 game main slate here on Tuesday, July 18. Um, back today. Unfortunately, couldn't get out anything yesterday, but uh, hopefully over the next little while, I'll be able to get back into a pretty regular schedule with the videos. Um, big slate, so don't want to spend too much time dilly-dallying around. Do have projections and ownership loaded to the site. Got some noise coming through, right? Some big red numbers in the standard deviations popping up here so far, so um, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Notably, it's uh, with, you know, in, in ownership with Brian Wu, um, you know, with pretty popular plays here this kind of happens but uh you know a nine standard deviation in the ownership figure pretty big number we want this you know down in the in the two to three range normally so uh some noise still coming through as you know same sort of deal here in the in the own or the raw projection for hunter brown um you know some places still jacking around and, and haven't put out a uh, a really good number just yet, suffice to say. So that said, uh, construction-wise, we don't really have anybody projecting north of 17, 18 points here. Um, and that's kind of hard to do, generally, when we've got a 14-game slate. So what that suggests, I mean, it's warm across the league tonight. That suggests that we're likely to see some offense here. Um, probably a pretty high-scoring night would be the initial kind of gut reaction. Um Expensive guys, probably outsized to where they really should be, notably like a Joe Musgrove, Eddie Cabrera, um, Mitch Keller, probably a little bit pricey, certainly for the matchup. Nathan Eovaldi, definitely pricey for the matchup, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why none of these guys up here in the top end really projecting all that well. Um, so I think what we might want to do is try and stay in the mid-range here, get a little bit balanced, because there's certainly some expensive offenses we'd like to target tonight, um, you know, that are likely to, I mean, they're certainly in very good spots, likely to provide a, a good bit of upside for us. So, spiel done and over with. Let's just get into it. Cleveland and Pittsburgh needed the Guardians last night, um, put up an 11 spot against young debut arm Quinn Priester. Talk about him as we go into the season. Um, you know, Interesting pitching matchup here tonight. Unlikely to really see a hell of a lot of offense, I think, because Logan Allen and Mitch Keller both are pretty respectable arms, right? 7,700 for Logan Allen here. I think it is very much in play. Um, now, in the early going here, a pretty low projection and, and not popping naturally in the value score just yet. Low ownership, though, I'm, I'm pretty intrigued with because overall, Logan Allen in his 12 starts since he came up a couple months ago has been pretty respectable. He's he's mostly just average in about every single category here. He's very efficient early in the count. This is well above average here. Everywhere else is, uh, you know, pretty right in line with, um, you know, what the league average is. And he doesn't get picked apart really by... Uh, certainly in the opposite end of the platoon here, despite not having you know, a really good uh, sort of ground ball, weak contact type of pitch here in the cutter. But he does have the four-seamer change to keep the right-handers off balance, and he gets a little bit of swing and miss here throwing the slider to righties as well. Um, got Naturally, with the four-seamer slider combination, he's going to get a little bit you know, if you've got whiffs, that is going to get a little bit more swing and miss to same-handed hitters. And that's kind of what we see here in the early short sample of just 50 hitters against the lefties. Um, but for the most part, he's going to give up a little bit of batting average to the right-handers. And that's due to the lack of a a, a cutter here. And however, the, the power suppression is going to be there, certainly with a respectable changeup. Um, so overall, he's... In play, he's an average arm. I don't really want to go out of my way to be clicking in 30% of Logan Allen necessarily, but I think this is a perfectly fine spot because Pittsburgh against left-handers this year is roughly a, a break-even in average offense too, right? Average K rate, 
slightly below average in the power, slightly below average in the hard contact. They hit a lot of ground balls, though, however. And at a buck fifty ground ball to fly ball, I think that's generally a, a pretty good suppression metric to target. Against right handers, Logan Allen inducing a buck forty ground ball ground balls per fly ball there. So um with thirty five percent hard contact, it's a little notable here, but with one forty uh, in the ground balls per fly ball. I think it's okay. We can stomach that. It's not the worst figure in the world. We do have to note he does have a 350 ERA with an XFIP about three quarters of a run higher than that. Pretty high strand rate here so far, still pushing 80%. That'll come down as he gets more work under his belt, of course. But overall, I think it's a, a pretty playable spot for Logan Allen. Um, you know, it's certainly at low ownership. I think you can get 10% or so of Logan Allen here and, pretty, and feel pretty confident with it. However, on the other side, you've got some guys that are, uh, well, notably, uh, Andrew McCutcheon just got back from the DL. Uh, he's got some pretty good numbers against lefties this season. Connor Joe's got fantastic numbers against lefties. He's likely to lead off dual eligible at first base in the outfield. 2,600, I think this is one of the best value plays of the day. He's probably where I want to start if I'm going to be playing any of the Pirates. You could play some short three-mans like a Joe Kutch and a Henry Davis. Throw in a Brian Reynolds if you want. He's kind of expensive, 4800 Not super thrilled about that. But they've got cheap piece, pieces here. Andy Rodriguez is a high upside catcher piece for them. Likely to get the bulk of the catcher work going forward for them because they've had zero production from behind the plate from an offensive perspective all season. So... Um, Plenty of cheap pieces here. I don't really want to be full stacking a right-handed heavy uh, Pittsburgh lineup against you know a, a pretty respectable arm, one that I do respect over here in Logan Allen on a full 14-game slate in Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh uh, PNC does still suppress right-handed power quite a bit. So um, overall, I think some playable pieces here, mostly a Logan Allen here, I think, uh, from Cleveland's side, but if you want to play a couple of Pittsburgh pieces, I think that's playable for sure. Mitch Keller on the other side, I think he's a little bit expensive here for me. Now, I love Mitch Keller. He's got the excellent fastball mix here, really solid distribution. We've talked about this several times this year. Um, this is very difficult to accomplish, right, with three plus-plus fastballs. Usually you'll have a guy with just one, if he even has one, Um increasingly more rare that you see a guy with two and it's a total like unicorn here when you see a guy with this type of dif distribution getting this much equity above the field all in the fastball mix the problem with Mitch, with Mitch Keller that is is his changeup is still a very much a work in progress and the breaking arsenal with the slider curveball combination he's giving up a little bit in aggregate to the field here and still throwing it a full 25% of the time or so. Um, so that's really his issue. And at 9,900, I, I want some more, certainly against Cleveland, I need some more swing and miss. He only has a 9% swing strike right here. It's just not high enough at this price tag, even though I really love the fastball mix. He, he's got to develop out the off-speed and the breaking stuff a little bit better for me to get super excited about paying such a high price tag for him. That said, he is 3% owned here, and if you want to get to a guy that's super efficient early in the count, that's got upside to blast through a, a pretty low upside offense uh, in a decent ballpark to pitch in in PNC. I think this is perfectly fine if you land on it. I'm not going to go out of my way to do this because I think the price tag is too high for the strikeout upside that he offers in this matchup, right? Just 19% here in aggregate against righties for Cleveland on the season no power no hard contact and a lot of ground balls so that's where mitch keller's really going to excel i think this is mostly a suppression matchup he could strike out five or six certainly and go seven innings i think that puts him in squarely in play uh, but at 9900 we do certainly have to balk at the lack of raw swinging strike stuff so uh overall pitching mostly in this game here i'm not playing cleveland on a 14 game slate against a really really good arm at a bad ballpark uh so no thank you there so mostly just pitching here all right, let's move on to the Dodgers and balls in Baltimore. Um, mostly offense here for me, I think. I don't want to do the deal with Michael Grove uh, really at all. This is a bullpen arm here. He's got a bullpen arsenal with the four-seamer slider, throwing the cutter very rarely at just 3% here so far and no changeup. So that's what's leading to all of the power to left-handers, 345 batting average with a 435 Woba and a 241 ISO. 
11% walk rate, buck 17 ground ball to fly ball. That's not encouraging there. And then we look at the hard contact, 38% with a 27% line drive rate. Every single metric here against lefties so far in the 100-hitter sample this season is pretty terrible, 1.8 homers per nine. He's got an aggregate 9.5% barrel rate. It's a little concerned. It's not terrible, but it's really not good. He's far, far better against right-handers, even though he's still given up some balls in the air and some homers. So he's got some loud contact issues, and I don't want to deal with that against uh, Baltimore. They're going to platoon very heavily here, and every single one of these guys, really in the top six, has got fantastic numbers against right-handers this year. Gunner, in particular, really, really good numbers, 4,700. He's one of the best plays of the day, um, as he is usually leading off against a right-hander. Rutch is fine at 52, kind of an average, not necessarily a, a value price tag for him, but he's fine to mix it in stacks. Same with Santander at 45. Ryan O'Hearn, the best price-adjusted play, I think. We'll have to keep an eye on Cedric, still dealing with a quad, I believe, that he tweaked over the weekend. So keep an eye out for that, but um, full stacks certainly here, certainly in play here against uh, Michael Grove. It's going to be hard to stack the game, however, because I'd really like to go after Tyler Wells, too, with the Dodgers. It's mostly the price tags that are going to keep you off of full game stacks because I'm not I'm not playing Tyler Wells either. Now, I, I really like the arsenal for Tyler Wells. The problem with him is that he's a pretty heavy fly ball pitcher, and he's got a homer problem pretty terribly. Uh, with an 11.5% barrel rate, he's got 40% hard contact nearly to the right side here. Gives up a lot of production to right-handers. Pretty good against the lefties because of the cutter here that he throws a full 20% of the time. Cutter-slider combo gets him some whiffs, of course, uh, but we want to be careful when we're dealing with a guy at a pretty high price tag here, 9400 against one of the best offenses in baseball. Uh, he's got a homer problem and a full raw you know, 5% homer rate. That's an issue. He's not going to walk a lot of people, so it's for the most part going to be of the solo variety. doesn't allow a hell of a lot of base runners. Doesn't give up a lot of average, right? Just a 220 XBA here, even though his realized metrics are a little bit lower, perhaps running a bit hot, but no matter way, how you slice it, um, a 220 XBA is a pretty damn good figure. Same thing with a 302 X Wob and a 220 X ISO. That's where we really start to get concerned. It's a 261 realized ISO to the right side of the plate. So if we were, are going to get to some Dodgers here, I'd really prefer to get to some Mookie, some J.D. Martinez, and some Will Smith. They're going to platoon for the most part as they do with like a David Peralta, Jason Hayward. But these guys have got pretty damn good numbers, at least respectable figures against right-handers all season. And it's not like Tyler Wells is going to be totally immune to giving up some balls in the air and a little bit of pop to the lefties either, right, with a 156 ISO and an 075 ground ball to fly ball. So uh, you can mix in full stacks of the Dodgers. Full stacks, my preference would be Baltimore um, going after Tyler Wells. I just can't play him at this price tag in this matchup. It's going to be warm in Baltimore. I I would not be surprised if this is the highest scoring game of the night. Um, we'll get to a couple others, of course, but this is a, both of these arms are very much attackable, and you could see some crooked numbers get thrown up on the board. Um, I want nothing to do with pitching here and offense only. I tried to build some game stacks here in the early morning, um, but it's going to be very difficult. You'd have to double punt on the mound. So it's probably you're probably going to have to pick and choose who you like the best, uh, but I've got no problems getting to either side, and I'm going to try and get to as much as I can. Okay, let's move on. San Diego, Toronto, Joe Musgrove, and Alec Manoa. Um, Musgrove, 9,600. I think he's overpriced, too, certainly for this matchup. He's got far depressed strikeout stuff to the right side this season. 14 starts now. It's not like a short sample anymore. He got 79 and a third for him. Uh, against right-handers, 145 hitters, give or take, just a 21% K rate. He does get some ground balls still, which is encouraging, at a buck 60 ground ball to fly ball. So that keeps him in play a lot. However, we want Musgrove... Certainly at depressed price tags for the most part, um, and of which 9,600 is not. And we want some more balanced and a little bit lefty-heavy lineups in terms of the floor that we're, we're after uh, with Musgrove because he's got a 26.5%, 27% K rate against the left side. The production that he gives up there is far less um, despite the slightly heavier fly ball lean with some line drives. He's got a really good cutter here, which is kind of a roll-me-over, right ground ball, soft contact type of pitch. And that 
really allows him to suppress contact and production against a left-hander. So, um, as we can see here, a 226 batting average allowed and 180 hitters, not a short sample there, against lefties. But against the right-handers, a 277 batting average allowed. Every metric is, is pretty much, uh, at least the ones we need to look at for DFS, far better against left-handers. And Toronto's really not going to have a lot of lefties in the lineup. They'll have... Th- three or, or whatever it is, right, with a Brandon Belt, a Varsho, a Kiermaier, something like that. But we'd like to see, if we're going to play Joe Musgrove at pretty high price tags, we'd like to see a few more lefties in the lineup and certainly a bunch of righties that don't hit right-handers as well as they do. So do I want to go out of my way to stack against Musgrove? No, I don't. Um, I, I like stacking Toronto against right-handers usually, but Musgrove's still certainly a well above average arm and this is a you know commensurately a kind of a below average matchup for Toronto even though they're well above average right despite their platoon disadvantage against right-handers 21% K rate in a, in a buck 11 WRC plus the hard contact and the power still leaves it on the table so I don't really want to go out of my way to stack some of these guys if I had to choose it'd be like a Springer Bichette Vladdy type of stack Matt Chapman, not necessarily at 4,900. It's okay. I don't really want to play wit on a 14-game slate um, at this particular price tag. And like I said, Dalton Varsho is going to strike out a crap load. Brandon Belt probably will too, despite a an attractive 2,900. you got to choose between him and Vladdy. So kind of difficult to stack Toronto still without the dual eligibility of Brandon Belt um, having lost that is down to sole first base again. So not... Overly thrilling to be playing Toronto here at their normal normal price tags uh, against Musgrove. But um, it had kind of enough in the tank for Musgrove to take me off of both Toronto and enough in the tank for Toronto to take me off of Musgrove. Uh, it's mostly the price tag that I'm not interested with here for Musgrove, though. Um, and certainly, of course, the, the matchup contributes to that. So I'm going to stay off of him and mostly off of Toronto, I think, as well. Um, I think this is kind of just an average match or a below average matchup, and there's far better spots I think we can get to uh, in the batter's box. Certainly, Alec Manoa on the mound, I'm not dealing with this. Um, I know what the numbers say, and I know he was excellent in his um, in his first start back from... I, I mean, let's not get it confused. You don't get set down to freaking rookie ball from the majors, and you don't fix the problems... Uh, in just a month. I, I know Toronto is, is confident in that, and um, at least from a, a risk perspective and a DFS perspective, um, I'm not confident in that. So he had Detroit in his in his first outing back. That's a, a pretty good spot for Toronto to bring him back up and give him some confidence, but San Diego is not Detroit, and they're not going to strike out nearly as much as Detroit does against right-handers, just 22%. This is a tick better than average. They walk a crap load. It's mostly from Soto, but it's not like Tatis and Manny Machado and Xander Bogarts aren't going to walk and take pitches and work counts. Um, This is a super dangerous lineup to be going after, and suffice to say that the, the problem with Manoa has been mechanics due to... The, all of the weight that he put on uh, in this in this last off season, uh, he's carrying a lot of extra weight here, and it's really screwed up to mechanics. And you can't do that as a starting pitcher. So um, I'm not convinced just yet. I need to see him. Well, number one, he's not a high upside strikeout DFS type of pitcher to begin with. And when you throw a 14% aggregate walk rate on the season on top of that, uh, it's just a total non-starter for me. I do like a. 7100 price tag relative to everybody else we've got going on the slate today so it's intriguing in that respect but that respect only uh for me at least i'm not going to deal with this i need to see far far more out of alec Manoa. he was absolutely atrocious all season and it wasn't necessarily just in contact it was mostly the walk rate he was elevating his pitch out as we see here he was still throwing 90 pitches per but he was only going four and four and two thirds here it's because he could not find the freaking plate. Um, he's got to be able to throw strikes, and that's a mechanics issue. It's a release point issue, and as I mentioned, it's it's due to really not being in shape. Uh, you can't let yourself go as much as he did. So, um, is he still attackable? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, like I said, I'm not totally convinced that he's fully solved the mechanics problems. Um, 
So you can play the Padres, absolutely. They're at their normal price tags, which kind of takes me off a little bit. This is a, a fine hitter's park for them and a guy that's displayed some real vulnerabilities all season. So uh, I have no problems going after Alec Manoa. I mean, he's not going to be played. I don't really think he should be. Um, so I, I really agree with where the projection and the ownership are coming in as of right now. Uh, I'm going to play the wait-and-see game with him, and before I start playing him in super down matchups like this, uh, I need to see that he, he's got this walk rate under control, and one start against Detroit where you go six or seven innings and, and strike out a, a bunch of them uh, is not the best metric um, to predict future success necessarily. So uh, I'm going to stay off of pretty much everything in this game, I think. Um, just mostly a write-off here. Okay, let's move on to San Francisco and Cincinnati. This is one of the really popular games of the night, um, and it, it really should be. Disco's coming off the DL here. He had right shoulder fatigue. Uh, I'm certainly not screwing around with that. Uh, he's a pretty low upside DFS arm anymore. Still getting some ground balls to the right side, but the, the change-up issues that he had earlier in his career really started to rear their head again, rear its head again, I, I suppose. Um, bad, bad change-up here. And that makes him really susceptible to left-handers, of course, and we do see that materialize here at a 182 ISO with a 289 batting average. 337 Woba, pretty high figure considering that he doesn't walk anybody, right? Just a 4% walk rate to the left side of the plate. He's not throwing it past anybody, no swinging strikes, similar to a Mitch Keller sub 10% swing strike rate. We need more out of starting pitchers because they're going to pitch to a lot of contact, right? 82%. When you do that, you have to have a floor. You have to be able to throw it past people in order to earn those points back that you're likely to give up when you give up production. And Disco's certainly going to do that here. It's warm in Cincinnati, you know, 80, 85 degrees. Um, and this lineup is incredibly dangerous. They brought up another one of their very top prospects. This is, what, three on the year, I think, uh, in Christian Encarnacion Strand. He came over in the Tyler Molly trade from the Twins last season. And he's another infield piece, uh, very, very high upside. Kid can absolutely rake. He is hitting from the right side, so we'll probably end up staying off of him. However, he's still at the Stone Min 2000. Unfortunately, you've got to pick and choose between him and Ellie De La Cruz now because they're both only third base eligible. We'll see what happens with them. You know, they've got four infielders here, uh, CES, Ellie, Matt McClain, and Johnny India. Uh, we're going to see I – mean, the Reds might be difficult to stack going forward. Um, because they might DH some LE, they might DH some CES. Um, Johnny India is likely to be in there every night, but he's only going to be playable at second base. Likely the same with Matt McClain. So um, we'll have to see how multi-position eligibility fleshes out for the Reds going forward. Needless to say, tonight you're not going to be able to play all the guys you want to play and stack against Disco. It would be just the lefties, um, but you could mix in if you need an extra 4,500, I mean, that's a full two players nearly uh, in an in average here. Uh, if you need that kind of salary saving, go ahead and drop down to a CES. It's perfectly fine, even though Ellie has far, far more upside from the left side of the plate against Disco. Um, so Red Stack certainly in play here. If you want to get to some TJ Friedel, I think he's still playable at 4,400. Jake Fraley as well, 49. Start to balk at the price tag a little bit, but Joey Votto, 46, going to cheapen it up for us a little and I think is a very good spot. Disco back in Cincinnati. Uh, There's a small ballpark, and with a bad changeup, in a downside of a platoon, he's likely to struggle quite a bit. So no Disco for me. Reds only. And Luke Weaver going for them on the mound. No Weaver for me. 6,500. The Giants here likely to be at least top two in ownership today. Um, and they, they certainly should be. They're far, far too cheap for this particular matchup in this ballpark. Lamont Wade up top, 3,800, still just first base eligible, unfortunately, so you're going to have to choose if they put him and, like, a Wilmer Flores in there uh, or something. Unlikely that they'll play both of them, but they've done it before, so you have to keep an eye out for that. But Jock is at 4,400, not showing a lot of power this season because he had the wrist, got hit on the hand or whatever it was earlier in the year. But 4,400, very playable price tag. This is a short porch in right field, and he's still got excellent numbers uh, throughout his career against right-handers. And Luke Weaver gives it up to everybody. Um, 
So he's not, he's not going to throw a pass anybody. He's going to get on the barrel here at a full 11% clip. Major hard contact to the right side mostly. At least he has a changeup that he suppresses hard contact with. So if you want to get a little bit contrarian in your giant stacks tonight, uh, play some right-handers. Certainly don't leave them off of stacks. They're going to platoon pretty heavily, so the only righty that's almost definitely going to be in the lineup is likely to be J.D. Davis. Um, so don't forget about him. He'll be less popular than the lefties, certainly. But you can mix him in, try to get a little bit contrarian with it. And you're going to have to play some guys down at the bottom of the lineup. Um, but they're all cheap enough and, and very much playable. This is a pretty excellent spot to go after some Luke Weaver here. No, op or no pitching here for me and only offense. All right, let's move on to the White Sox and the Mets. Giolito on the mound. I think he's very much playable at 9,300. I think this is one of the guys in this range. I'm pretty okay playing. Uh, we'll get to another one here in a little bit um, you know, later on tonight. But I think Giolito certainly qualifies. I, I don't, I'd much rather play Giolito than uh, Tyler Wells, for example, uh, at 94. Much rather play Giolito than Joe Musgrove, for example. Um the Mets are just a bad offense, man. We've been talking about this a lot recently. After a while, we just have to kind of accept that the numbers are going to be what they're going to be. And they're really falling right back in line to where they were last year. Overall, just a, a break-even creation offense. They're going to be sticky. They're not going to strike out a lot. They're going to take some professional at-bats and make some pitchers work. But for the most part, not going to hit for a hell of a lot of outsized power relative to all the teams that we've got on the slate. Or got on... Most slates, really. Just a 162 ISO. Average, slightly below average hard contact rate. Slightly above average for an offense. Strikeout rate, but the walk rate's normal, as is the the batted ball profile here. Buck 15 ground ball to fly ball. So, overall, they're very much attackable. They're, they'll strike out, and I think that puts G. Lito in play. Still got really good whiff stuff, certainly to the lefties here. Um, now... Guys like uh, Brandon Nimmo, Frankie Lindor, Danny Vogelbach, Jeff McNeil from the left side, not necessarily going to strike out a lot. But even their best hitter from the left side of the plate, Frankie Lindor, he's got some pretty poor numbers against right-handers this season. So I think it very much puts Giolito in play because that's really been his weakness. It's been lefties. And, you know, so if I had to choose, it'd be like a Brandon Nimmo against him. Danny Vogelbach, he's got pop, but he has to you know, realize that pop, uh, you, you got to make some contact here and stop, you know, taking so many damn pitches and, and walking so much um, in order to, to realize some of that production upside. So this is in city field. Now it's warm right over in, in New York tonight. So we got to keep that in mind that we'll play up pop a little bit because Giolito is still a fly ball pitcher with a fly ball lean, give up a little bit of hard contact north of 30%, about 32% in aggregate right to both sides of the plate. He's mostly attackable with the lefties, so if you want to get there, uh, you can always play PD. He's down under 5,000 now at 4,800. This is a damn good play against pretty much everybody in baseball. You could play a short little Nimmo, Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonso stack. Kind of expensive to be going after Giolito, though, with something like that. However, so not my favorite to be playing the Mets. I would rather just get to some Giolito, and it Sub 10% ownership, I think he's very much in play. He's got 25 and 30 in the tank here. He could go six and strike out seven or something like that and maybe just give up a run um, and, and really keep the Mets off the board. It's a bad offense, and I like going after them a little bit with high upside arms like Giolito. On the other side, Cookie has been far better, 6,200 for him. Um, now, I, he's in play at this price tag. He Down here, he's probably going to be the guy we're most confident with even though it's kind of a gulpy play. The, the issue with Cookie here, at least this season, he's been far better against left-handers. The changeup's been pretty damn respectable, to be quite honest. Even though he doesn't have a lot of raw swing and miss, right, just 15% to the lefties, 17.5% to the righties, um, it's the changeup that's really inducing a lot of kind of rollover type of contact. He still does get a lot of ground ball, buck 70 ground ball to fly ball to the left-handers. A little bit lower to the right-handers, and this is how we want to attack Cookie, I think. 270 batting average, 372. Whoa, that's a really, really big figure here with a 269 ISO allowed against right-handers. 37% hard, 2.5 homers per 9. Probably a little bit noisy for Cookie because he was dealing with the injuries or whatever. Um, so you're likely to see these tick down a little bit, but he's got to find out a way to get more value out of this four-seamer slider combination in order to get some swing and miss or at least get some more ground balls out of it 
and give up far less hard contact. So that's how I want to go after uh, Cookie here if we're going to do it. And unfortunately, even though he is in play at 6,200, and I am kind of attracted to this because there's really not a lot of arms that we're going to get of get you know super thrilled about playing down here in this range if we need to get down here. Like he'd be the guy, but like the White Sox are going to platoon pretty damn heavily here tonight. They've only got what two lefty, three lefties, I guess, and maybe four um, that they'll throw in the lineup with a Gavin Sheets, Colos, Grandal if he if he even catches, uh, and then of course Ben Intendi. Um, outside of that, you know their their right handers are pretty respectable hitters that don't strike out a hell of a lot. Tim Anderson, Luis Robert, he's going to whiff, of course, but he's Luis Robert. He's got the most upside of anybody. Aloy Jimenez is hurt again. Uh, stop me if you've heard that before. Um, Jake Berger's going to strike out against the guy throwing the freaking first, you know, the, the throwing out the first pitch. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of upside to keep them off the table for Cookie. That's why I think he's a little bit intriguing down here at this price tag. But undoubtedly, this is a pretty dangerous spot because he gives up so much production to the right-handers. And even though in aggregate for the White Sox this year, just an 84 WRC plus with some strikeouts and average everywhere else, they're going to still hit some ground balls. So I think that puts him in play. But I, I do think a piece here or there from the White Sox is in play as well. Certainly, if Cookie starts to see any steam, he, he's not going to push even 15% or something like that. So I think that's probably how I'd like to side and just play a little bit of him. Um, you know, but I'm... <laughs> I'm not super comfortable with it, uh, to say the least. So mostly just a Giolito here for me. Um, very little of the White Sox. A, a, a Luis Robert, sure, at, at 57. You can play some Tim Anderson. That's okay at 39. you got to be careful. You want guys that are going to be able to lift the baseball and try and get it in the air. And that's, unfortunately, like a Jake Berger who's got a 73% strikeout rate or whatever the hell it is. Um, Andrew Vaughn's an okay play here at 37. So if you want to go like a short stack, Robert, Vaughn, Jake Berger, or throw in a Tim Anderson, something like that, that's okay. But mostly just Giolito and a little bit of cookie here for me too, uh, going after the White Sox. All right, let's move on to Arizona and Atlanta. Zach Davies on the mound, no thank you, 6,900. Just an absolute uh, non total non-starter for me. 19% K rate against Atlanta. We're just not doing this. He's got a 53% strike one rate. This is mostly the number that takes me off. Um, it's the 10% walk rate. He, he's elevating his own pitch count. He, he's not even... He's not able to go deeper than four and two thirds in pretty much every start. Now we had the injury or whatever, you know, early in the season, et cetera. Um, you know, no matter. This is Atlanta. I'm not going after a very low upside arm in Zach Davies at a totally nonsensical price tag at 6,900. I think he's way overpriced. He'd have to be 4,900 for me to consider this. Um, so no thanks. However, he doesn't have a an egregiously high barrel rate. Just six percent here and that could take us off of some Atlanta that he, he does still induce some ground balls he stays down in the strike zone with the sinker change combination induces a little bit of swing and miss to same handed hitters with the curveball 23% K rate to the right handers now Atlanta's not going to strike out a lot right over the last month and a half or so they've, been, they've only been striking out against right handers at like an 18% clip they've been outrageously hot they're full 30 games over 500 this is the best DFS stack in baseball um you know far better than the Dodgers better than Tampa better than Texas because all of these guys when they get there they hit the baseball over the wall however they do still have a slight ground ball lean right at a buck 25 ground ball to fly ball and that's what Zach Davies does induce over here to buck 30 himself so if you want to come off of a little Atlanta I don't think this is bad necessarily and getting some exposure is certainly warranted with some Acuna some Austin Riley um, some Eddie Rosario, if you want to do that. Matt Olson, sure, he's the only, you know, like pure raw fly ball hitter on the team. And he's from the left side here, but he's 6,000. These guys are not cheap still. So if you want to get off of some of this, I think this is okay because there are plenty of other offenses. We talked about a couple already that we might consider getting to, notably Baltimore and the Dodgers, who are just far cheaper than Atlanta. I'm not playing Ozzie Albies second base, 5,700. It's just not happening. Um, I think he, he is not this good a hitter, and he's overperformed quite significantly to really where he should be. My favorite price adjusted, I mean, it's always Acuna, right? 6,600. I think he's still underpriced. Um, outside of that, it's Austin Riley, 5,200. Now, his numbers haven't been all that excellent this season, certainly against right-handers. 
But price adjusted, if you want to get to somebody in the top half of the lineup, in addition to Acuna, it's got to be him. It's certainly not Ozzy Albies. And you're, you have to balk at Matt Olson at 6,000. Um, if you want to stack Atlanta, yeah, go ahead. You can get there with five stacks. But once again with them, they have to have everybody hitting the baseball over the wall because the only one that creates any offense for them outside of hitting it out is Acuna. These guys are not going to steal bases all that regularly, so it's got to be them, and when they're not hitting it over the wall and they're hitting some of these ground balls here, an arm like Zach Davies could keep them off the board, even though he really shouldn't. He's got a 55% strain right here. This is terribly, terribly low for somebody that does still get ground balls. Is a 640 ERA with a 460 xFIP. I mean, we're talking nearly two full runs of positive regression coming to him, even though he's not a high upside strikeout arm. He stays off of the barrel and doesn't really get picked apart in terms of hard contact. So that could keep him uh, serviceable. And you could see a full five innings out of him. You could also see two and a third, and he gives up a nine spot or something. You know, let's not get it confused. This is still Atlanta. So go ahead and stack the Braves if you want. But uh, I'm personally going to probably try and target some short stacks for them uh, and stay off of that. I know we went kind of long here, but um, Atlanta's an offense that we can, you know, certainly do all kinds of analysis on. Uh, Bryce Elder on the mound for them, 7,800. Now we're getting down into the price range with him where uh, we're not just like totally writing him off. Um, 7,800 is far more attackable. However, you just still have a 3-0 ERA with a uh, an XFIP here, a run, run or a quarter higher than that, 81% strand rate. All of this is going to continue to tick down. We're continuing to see the ground ball to fly ball ratio drift downward against right handers. It was north of four and pushing four and a half earlier in the season. So we're seeing all of this tick down. He's The hard contact rate, however, is persisting against right handers. It's still at 40%. Now, the uh, uh, ground ball to fly ball ratio north of three, we still don't, um, you know, totally balk at a 40% hard contact rate. But this is a huge, huge figure. And I've been talking about this with Elder for a long time. He's way overpriced, or he has been way overpriced for this type of contact profile. You cannot give up 38% hard contact. Uh, I don't care how many ground balls you get. You're eventually going to get picked apart in the line drives too. So uh, still looking for more negative regression coming to Bryce Elder, certainly in the suppression and in the strand rate. Uh, probably not so much in power because it's really difficult for guys to lift the baseball and get it up over the wall because he still stays way, way down. But the fastball mix here is overly attackable, um, you know, giving up and out to the field on the four seamer and another half and out here on the two seamer. So with some left handers, it's certainly where we want to attack and just a 17 percent strikeout right there. He's not going to throw it past them necessarily. Buck 30 ground ball to fly ball there with a 35% hard contact. So that's far more attackable. And lucky for Arizona, they've got a lot of lefties here. They can platoon with. Um, so full stacks, if I had to choose one in this game, it'd be Arizona with Jerry Perdomo, Cattell Marte, Corbin Carroll, and mix in a, an Alec Thomas, Jake McCarthy. One of the right-handers as well, one or two even, if you want to do that with a, an Evan Longoria, Lourdes, or a Christian Walker. Also playable in stacks because this – this is a small ballpark down here in Atlanta, and it plays up power a lot when it's warm, and it's north of 90 degrees down there. So hot and humid means offense. And even against a high ground ball pitcher, uh, I think you can go after that a little bit because Arizona's not going to strike out a lot, just 20% in aggregate for them against right-handers this season. Super, super dangerous. So no pitching for me here in this game. Uh, really just offense, mostly the Diamondbacks, I think, at least in tournaments. Um, and you can always play Acuna and Olsen and Riley as he's, you know, one-offs or anything like that. All certainly very much playable. Okay, let's move on to Miami and St. Louis. Eddie Cabrera is back. He had some, I believe it was uh, shoulder tightness or shoulder fatigue or, or whatever the hell it was. Um, no, no matter. He's 9,700, and he's got real problems and hard contact issues to the right side as well. He does get, however, a far lower... Um, or. Uh, amount of ground balls, I should say, uh, than a Bryce Elder, right, in the in the previous game. Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball here for Eddie and 44% hard contact. So we're going in the wrong direction. And, well, he's 1,900 more expensive. So I think this is a total write-off. He has a 53% strike one rate. Now, I love the raw whiff stuff from Eddie, and that gives him upside. But he's a young arm, number one. They do this with, like, a Braxton Garrett as well. 
they, like Sandy Alcantara, they just let him you know throw eight innings when he should throw five. These young kids, they only let throw four innings when they should let him throw six. Um, so they really screw around with their pitchers here and. Well, unfortunately for Eddie, like he's got really good breaking stuff, and that's where all his swing and miss comes from. It's just that he can't throw strike one, can't get ahead of hitters, so he contributes to the philosophy of the um, the managing staff in pulling their young pitchers early because he elevates his own freaking pitch count. He throws 90 pitches per, but he only goes four and two thirds, uh, similar to like a you know Luke Weaver or something like that. Um, so we don't want to be dealing with a 52% strike one rate against Cardinals. This is still a very dangerous offense, even though they are 12 games under and a garbage pitching staff. Um, their offense still very much capable. Buck 12 WRC plus 21% K rate, buck 80 ISO nearly, and they're likely to get a high power bat, power high upside power bat, I should say, and Tyler O'Neill back uh, this evening. He's 3,700 in the middle of the lineup. Not my favorite going after him because, I mean, Eddie Cabrera is still a pretty respectable arm here, but he's going to give a pop to the right side. If you want to play some Cardinals, uh, yeah, sure, but you want to play Goldschmidt at kind of an elevated 5,600 price tag for him. I mean, I'd say elevated. It's not like he shouldn't be 5,600 or he doesn't warrant a 5,600 price tag, but he should probably be like a 5,000, 5,100 or so in this particular matchup. Same thing with Nolan Arenado. You're paying normal price tags for these guys up above 5,000, which kind of takes me off a little bit. That said, if Cabrera's going to walk everybody, then I don't really care, and that puts full stacks in play with good hitters that don't strike out a hell of a lot in Goldschmidt, in Arenado, from the right side of the plate. Throw in Brendan Donovan. He's cheap at, at 3,400. They've had him leading off. And they've got Lars in the middle of the lineup, sandwiching, or sandwiched between, I should say, Goldschmidt and Arenado. So they're very balanced here, lefty-righty, and they can make it super difficult on Eddie because this is a patient offense, and they still take professional at-bats. So uh, no Eddie here for me at this particular price tag. He'd have to be probably 77. Uh, even at 8,700, I don't think I'd consider this. Um, you know, I'd need him far, far cheaper than this to be stomaching this kind of walk rate and this kind of strike one rate. And a... You know, there's just no depth from him at, at four and a third, four and two thirds every start. So give me the Cardinals there if I had to choose, but not overly thrilled about going after him because he's still got a lot of upside. Jordan Montgomery on the mound for the Birds, 82. Um, yeah, yikes, man. They're probably going to have eight, maybe even nine righties in the lineup, depending on what they do with Luis Arise here tonight. Uh, I, I want nothing to do with that. I think the price tag for Jordan Montgomery against super right-handed heavy lineups um, it needs to be a little bit lower than this for me to get excited. It's not like he is a terrible arm or anything, but what we really want is at least some upside for him to really capitalize on the elite, elite production suppression that he exhibits against lefties. And when teams go really right-handed heavy against him, we just don't have that upside, right? He's got a 22% strikeout rate, even though it's the same against the lefties this year. The ISO allowed to the left-handers with the far reduced Woba as well at 260. ISO is at 06. And that's a, I mean, if you've got any lefty whatsoever, you do not want to be touching them against Jordan Montgomery. However, against the right handers, he gives up a 181 ISO with a 35% hard contact and a buck 20 ground ball to fly ball. So that's a far more attackable line here. And the Marlins are going to be able to do that against left handers this year. Now, most of this production is coming from Georgie Soler, who has been off the charts incredible. 124 WRC plus for the Marlins, sub 20% strikeout rate, 34% hard, buck 40 ISO in aggregate. But they've got a couple of guys here Brian De La Cruz, Georgie Soler, that can lift the baseball and can get it up and over the wall. So, um, that's kind of how I'd like to side here. It's mostly because of an elevated price tag and the number of righties that the Marlins are going to run out here against Jordan Montgomery. Even though I do respect him, I don't want to touch you know, 10% of my teams here with him in a, in a really, really difficult uh, strikeout matchup for him to realize any sort of floor. So um, I'm probably just going to leave him on the shelf. Wouldn't be surprised if he pops because he's still a very good arm. And he's still super efficient early in the count. Um, but it's the it's the platoon disadvantage here that kind of has me concerned a little bit at a slightly elevated price tag. So 
If I want to play some of the Marlins, it's just going to be probably short stacks here. I don't want to play a lot of their righties because they don't usually have a lot of power, like a, a Garrett Cooper, even though he has shown a little bit more this year. Yuli Gurriel and Gene Segura, no power whatsoever from these guys. John Birdie, same thing. He can't even get on base enough to steal bases this season. So, um, you know, I don't want to play anybody down at the bottom of the lineup. I just don't want to go out of my way to be playing Jordan Montgomery because they're all standing from the right side. So give me uh, Brian De La Cruz, Georgie Soler, and maybe mix in a Garrett Cooper, um, you know, or a John Birdie or something like that. But it's not overly thrilling, mostly just like one-offs here. Okay, Tampa and Texas should be a really good baseball game down here tonight. Uh, two decent arms. Taj Bradley's been bad recently. Um, his last three starts, he's had two difficult matchups, but he had one sandwiched in between those two against Seattle, and he got Beat to shreds there, too. Or excuse me, against Oakland. Um, nope, I clicked on the wrong guy. That was Tarek Skubal. It. Uh, I'm looking for Taj Bradley. There he is. I believe it was Seattle. Uh, yeah, it was. And he had Oakland, or excuse me, he had Atlanta and Arizona. Uh, getting a little tongue-tied here. Too many teams in the in the freaking league. Uh, he had Atlanta and Arizona, and he got beat up pretty good in both of those starts. Gave up six runs against Arizona and four against Atlanta. And the strikeout stuff was totally gone. It just kind of ex expected against those two teams. However, in that start against Seattle, in Seattle, he still only went three and a third, gave up five earned, and struck out just three in a far, far better matchup. This is Texas, another super difficult matchup, so I'm leaving him off the table too, or off my board today. At at 7,300, I just think he's, he's overpriced for the matchup. Um... I think he's going to excel in good matchups in general, right? Had a really good start earlier in the season where he struck at 11 and four and a third against Oakland. Uh, he survived for six full innings against Baltimore, who is kind of attackable sometimes with high upside right-handers. Struck out eight there, et cetera, et cetera. But in the first outing when he saw Texas in the early part of June, he went three and two thirds, struck out four, which is great, but he also gave up four runs. So, um, I think you could very reasonably see a similar outing from Taj tonight, even though he does have high upside whip stuff. Like you, you really can't go after that um, and target that with Texas. It's every damn one of these guys. They take really, really good at bats, similar to the Dodgers, similar to Atlanta. They're they're really tough outs. Um, so I'm not I'm not dealing with any Taj tonight here at 7,300. I just don't play pitchers against Texas for the most part. Really, really difficult to go after them. A lot of power patient team and this is a really high upside spot for them going after a pretty young arm let's not forget that Todd just came up about a month and a half two months ago too um, he's given up a lot of power to right-handers so you don't have to just like click in Corey Seager Nate Lowe necessarily or whoever they play in the outfield Jankowski or Robbie Grossman whatever uh, from the left side you can mix in some righties here and feel pretty okay with it Semyon, Addy Garcia, and Josh Young. Now, they're all very expensive, so I don't really want to go out of my way to be getting you know, 30% of the Rangers here tonight or anything like that. But these guys are very much playable because Taj has given up a lot of production, 42.5% hard contact with a neutral ground ball to fly ball against right-handers. That's a full 290 ISO. Now, he's running cold a little bit. Let's not get it confused with just a 162 aggregate X ISO. Um and a 313 X Woba, that's a pretty good number. 247 XBA in Agri, that's a pretty good number. It's the power that he's giving up to the right-handers. He's just getting onto the barrel here. And that's pretty dangerous because you need to neutralize Marcus Semien, Addy Garcia, and Josh Young if you're going to pick through Texas. And you just got to hope that Corey Seager doesn't tear you apart. Um, so this is a very difficult matchup for Taj. So I'm, I'm just going to leave him off the board here today. Uh, Nathan Eovaldi, 10-3. I think I'm probably going to do the same thing with him. Now, uh, like, he's been very good this season. However, his last six starts or so have not been good. And I think we're finally starting to see the regression start to set in. Um, in his last outing against Boston, went five and a third, gave up four. He was good against Houston before that when he went seven. But the strikeout stuff is starting to drop off a table. Struck out just three in his last outing against Boston, five against Houston. These are lower strikeout matchups. But the Yankees are going to strike out a little bit, only struck out five, less than a K in inning in that outing, struck out just four in six innings against White Sox. So he's been starting to downtrend a little bit in the strikeout department. He, he started out the season upwards 27, 28% or whatever, and this has totally fallen off a cliff. He's down to 21% against the lefties here, and he's still giving up the hard contact, the, the issues that have really plagued him in the past. Um, 
Now, he's still getting ground balls, so we can stomach a 34 35% hard contact rate when he's got a buck 70 ground ball to fly ball. That's fine. However, this is still Tampa, and I don't want to play pitchers against Tampa either. Certainly at elevated price tags with guys that I think it are likely to see a good bit of negative regression come to them. 280 ERA here for you of all the 365 XFIP. I, I think we're going to see some negative regression continue to sort of eat away at Eovaldi. Uh, even though he's been very good this season overall, the last six starts, we need him to get right first. And we're paying a very expensive price tag. He's the most expensive guy in the day in one of the worst matchups. So I'm probably just going to leave him off. And like I said, he's not projecting very well with respect to all of the other guys in the upper range. I mean, I'd rather just play guys far, far cheaper that don't have to face Tampa here tonight, that don't have some negative run suppression regression coming to them. So um, they're going to platoon heavily, and that's the downside of his matchup, certainly. Even though he does still induce some ground balls, he's very much attackable there with some lefties. Um, And this is kind of a hitter's ballpark a little bit, even though it does play kind of pitcher-friendly. I mean, when you got two offenses this powerful, it's going to play up offense really no matter who you've got on the mound. And both of these guys are very much tackable. So I'm going to stay off of pitching and get to as much offense as I can, even though it's not overly thrilling because these guys are super, super expensive. Okay, Washington and the Cubs. Patty Corbin, he's another guy down in the 6K range that is playable, that you're really just like closing your eyes and not watching a game uh, when you click him in. Um, 6,300 for him. Unfortunately for Corbin, he's just not throwing it past anybody. Like at 15% aggregate K rate, he's suppressing a little bit, even though he's got a you know five O ERA and a four and a half xFIP. It's not that type of suppression. It's mostly the hard contact suppression that I'm referring to, compared to last season at least. He's still giving up some pop and some production to the right-handers. 316 average, 365 wOBA. It's a big number and a 173 ISO, also a pretty big number with a low walk rate. So these figures not buoyed because of the wOBA in particular. Not buoyed because he's putting guys on base for free. It's contact, and he's pitching to 82% of it in aggregate. So it's not that he's super thrilling to be uh, considering, but you can go after the Cubs with left-handers. Um, are we concerned about a floor for Corbin? Yeah, absolutely. If he gives up two runs, he's pretty unlikely to be able to earn that back. He would have to you know, strike out well-outsized, you know, probably two to three standard deviations above his average, um, in order to make up two or three runs that he gives up, and he'd have to run deep into a game, which is unfortunately pretty unlikely for Corbin anymore. So I'd probably rather side with Cookie Carrasco if I get all the way down here, but I would not be surprised if Corbin suppresses here a little bit. They do still have some lefties that they're going to throw in there, the Cubs, um, because, frankly, David Ross doesn't have any idea how to build a, an equitable lineup. So who knows what they're what the hell they're going to do. They, like, he might lead off... a freaking Mike Talkman again for some stupid reason or whatever. Um, so we got to keep an eye on what they're going to do. If they go like super righty heavy and have like eight righties in the lineup, it's like, it takes me completely off of Corbin. Not that I'm on him a good bit necessarily anyway, but I, I do think he would be in play here in this particular matchup, 6,300, because the Cubs overall against lefties, even though they create a little bit, they're still going to strike out and... They're going to take some some pretty poor at-bats overall. But I, I think this is an okay spot to play mostly the Cubs here. But if you get to some Patty Corbin, I mean, you're not going to get all that much an argu- argument from me, um, even though you, I'd probably make you explain yourself. So that's how I'd probably like to get to it. It's mostly the Cubs, but really just because of their pricing. Nico's still a little bit spendy at 47, but Seiya Suzuki's down to 32. He's been terrible since he hurt the neck. Um, and Ian Happ really hasn't shown any power this season. Then you got Belly in the top half as well. So overall, those three guys, Suzuki, Happ, and Belly in the outfield, I mean, you don't want to play all three of them because you're taking up all three outfield spots, and it's kind of a down matchup for them a little bit. Nico, yeah, you can always play him, and then you've got like, Jan Gomes. I mean, you're not super thrilled about playing him, but you will be in the five hole, you know, in all probability, but like, are we really jacked about doing this? Not necessarily. Uh, Patty Wisdom and Chris Morell are, of course, the the big homer, you know, power upside bats for you. But do we really want to go out of our way and get a boatload of Patty Wisdom uh, down in the nine hole? Yeah, probably not. So not overly thrilled with the Cubs, to be quite honest. And that's why I think Patty Corbin could be in play a little bit. Jamison Tyon on the other side, 6,800. 
ugh, I, I really don't like this price tag. I wish he were down here in the 62-63 range like Cookie and Patty Corbin because at 68, I think in this strikeout matchup, it, it's really kind of dangerous. He's got really terrible splits here against left-handers, and Washington's going to platoon pretty heavily. They'll have like five, even six lefties in the lineup tonight. C.J. Abrams, they've been leading off a little bit. Luis Garcia, had they have unfortunately relegated him down to like the eight hole, uh, even against right-handers, who's been he's been very cold over the last little while since his early season numbers. Uh, but Jamer's still been good. Hit another bomb yesterday. Dom Smith has shown a little bit of upside. Um, you know, let's not get carried away with it. But same with Corey Dickerson. You know, these guys are cheap, and they're all hitting from the left side of the plate. And James Tyler's numbers against lefties this year. The 328 ISO with a 16% K rate, 12% walk rate, 33% hard contact, 065 ground ball to fly ball, three homers per nine. No thank you. Um, you know, against a, a really low strikeout team and a, a pretty dangerous um, sort of platoon team from from Washington over here. There's a lot of guys that are cheap and, and have upside at their relative price tag, certainly in this particular matchup. So if I were going to get to full stacks, it wouldn't really be the Cubs stacking against Patty Corbin. They're likely to be more popular than the Nationals here. I just throw in the Nationals, play Caber Ruiz behind the plate. That's okay, even though he doesn't really have any power either. Um, I'd probably rather get to Washington here than the Cubs. So for the most part, going to stay off of off or stay off of pitching. That is. Um, I'd like it if Tyone were a little bit cheaper here. It's a fine suppression matchup for him if he can run deep into a game. But if he starts giving up production uh, and starts walking people, he's got a 12% walk rate to the left side. Like, no thanks. Um, it, it, it might be a long night for Jamison Tyone over here. So I'm going to stay off of pitching for the most part, maybe mix in a couple Patty Corbin pieces, and I'll have some, some you know, like one-off Cubs pieces or something, maybe some short stacks. But uh, Nationals mostly for me here, I think, um, even though I generally don't like playing Washington on a full slate you know, to begin with, uh, they're in play. Okay, let's move on. Detroit and Kansas City. Interesting game here, too, at least on the mound. Tarek Skubal is back for his, what, third start, I believe. And he's been fine. He's got four innings in his previous two starts. He's a high strikeout upside guy. And, um, you know, obviously he's not going to be a 40% strikeout guy. This isn't you know, as Spencer Schreider we're talking about or anything. Um, but he is a 27, 28% K guy. And could we see that realized here against the Royals? Yeah, I think so. Despite the fact that I've mentioned several times this season, we want to be careful going after the Royals here with um, with left-handers. They still make a lot of hard contact. 35% is well above average. They're not going to hit for a lot of power because, unfortunately for them, a lot of the hard contact does come on the ground. In aggregate, yeah, it's not um, fleshing out necessarily, but their best hitters are really Bobby Witt and and Salvi Perez, you know, from the right side of the plate at least. And, um, you know, Salvi's going to hit some fly balls. And, uh, you know, Bobby Witt, unfortunately, he'll hit a, a lot of ground balls. He's down to 4,400, though. That makes him far more playable than the 6,000 or wherever the hell he was, you know, most of the season. Um, Salvi is, I believe, out. Uh, he, I forget what exactly happened to him. Um yeah, he's day to day and what he's strained a hammy, and that's what it was. Um, so probably not going to see him tonight. Likely to see Freddie Fermin behind the plate. Um, so he'll be up at the top of the lineup at you know a cheap twenty seven hundred. I don't think I don't think it really matters though. I would much rather play Der Tarek Skubal here at eighty four hundred. What I'm really concerned with is depth and them letting him go deep. Um, could he strike out seven or eight in five innings here? Yeah, absolutely. But I need five innings. And at 8,400, like we got to have a very minimum five inning floor here when we're eating this kind of price tag. So um, I have to keep an eye on that. I think that puts him squarely in play, certainly, if he can go five innings, because Kansas City's still going to strike out here, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. 25% aggregate strikeout rate on the season, despite the hard contact. They just don't create because they, the only guy they've got that's going to steal bases really is Bobby Witt. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, going to be difficult for the Royals, certainly without Salvi, to put together a lot of offense. So, I think Tarek Skubal is very much in play here, and if sub-15% ownership, I'm okay getting to some of him. Um, unless it comes out that he is going to be limited once again to about four innings, I think you can, you can mix in some of this to your pools. I wouldn't get super crazy with it and 
you know, 25% of your teams or anything. But, um, you know, 15 to 20%, I think, is is probably pretty okay in this 80, you know, mid-8K range or so. Daniel Lynch on the mound for the Royals, 6,300. He's another guy down here in the six, low 6K range I think could be in play. Now, I want to be really careful going after the Tigers here with left-handers that have some real serious problems against some right-handers. Historically, Daniel Lynch has given it up in spades to right-handers, and that's not really changing this season. Excuse me. Not really changing this season. The Tigers make 37% hard contact nearly against lefties this year. 94 WRC+. plus. Not the worst team in baseball. Just a 22-23% strikeout rate. It's right around average. Buck 60 ISO, right around average. So with a neutral ground ball to fly ball and a lot of hard contact, I want to be really careful with Daniel Lynch here if I get to any of him. I'm probably going to stay off of it because I don't like going after the Tigers usually with super high variance left-handers like Daniel Lynch that don't have a hell of a lot of upside. He's not going to throw it past a lot of these guys. What would put me on to him is the really good changeup value. He's got a very good changeup. It's the fastball sort of four-seamer cutter mix here that's really leaving it on the table and why he's giving up so much power. Cutter is bad. Slider is bad. Doesn't really have a raw swing and miss pitch, even though he stays down in the strike zone against um, right-handers a little bit with the changeup. He gives it all right back in terms of ground ball to fly ball ratio with a four-seamer and a cutter that he can't get in on the hands to right-handers. So overall, the arsenal not super impressive with Daniel Lynch, and that's what leads to so much production, 35% hard and the 075 ground ball to fly ball to the righty. So um, I think you can play some right-handers here from Detroit, in particular uh, Matt Veerling. He's fine up at the top. Javi Baez, I'm totally staying off. I think he stinks, and he's still overpriced. He should be 3400 but you could play Torque at 37. It's all right. Uh, unfortunately, just sole first base. And at 37, probably like him a little bit cheaper as well. Andy Abanya's price adjusted. Got to be the favorite, I think. He's got fantastic numbers against left-handers this year. Second base and outfield eligible. But unfortunately, he's going to be down to like the 6 or the 7 even. Um, so not super thrilling to be going after the Tigers here. Probably just one-offs. I think for me, uh, from the batter's box perspective, you want to mix in maybe a Daniel Lynch here or there. Yeah, he could pop for 20, 22 points here. Um, but not overly thrilling to be playing really anybody for me outside of Tarek Skubal, because I think he's certainly got the most upside of anybody uh, in the game. Okay, let's move on to Houston, Colorado. Similar to San Francisco and Cincinnati, it's going to be another popular game, as it is pretty much always, and I think we can go after everybody in uh, really for the rest of the season against Colorado. Um, everybody on their pitching staff is either hurt or young or bad um, or a combination of the of those three. So um, Houston, that puts them squarely in play. Of course, they're just they're not expensive enough. Kyle Tucker is jacked up to six thousand, so that's attractive. But it doesn't really matter. You can still play him. Uh, he doesn't strike out, and he's going to hit the baseball in the air here at Coors Field. Uh, it's very warm, ninety degrees or so at Coors tonight. Um, shouldn't have to deal with any weather, I don't believe. So uh, you know. You're going to get to as much Houston as you can. You're going to have to balance ownership as always. Um, here in their early going with Houston, we had unfortunately don't have uh, an announced starter for Colorado. I've got Noah Davis in here, so we don't know exactly who they're going to get. I do have Davis. Uh, it could just be a raw bullpen game for them, and they might throw out like a Matt Cook. Um, if they actually throw a bullpen game here, that would kind of take me off of Houston. Colorado's bullpen has been, well, better than their starting staff uh, this full season, even though they're not great, and this is Coors Field, uh, and this is the Rockies pitching staff, uh, they, they have been better than the starters. However, if it is Noah Davis, uh, he's pretty unlikely to be able to last much longer than three innings anyway. So you're going to get a lot of the Colorado bullpen either way. Um, does that mean you could come off of some Houston stacks? Well, yeah, because their ownership is going to spike pretty hard as soon as Colorado eventually announces a starter and we get a line on the game. Um, we don't have that still here at pretty late into the morning. Um, so we'll see what they want to do. They might have to call Noah Davis back up or you know, who, who the hell knows what, what's going on over with the Rockies. Uh, this, I believe, is Kyle Freeland's spot in the rotation. and Unfortunately, he's hurt now too. So um, we really aren't sure just yet, but you can play every one of the Astros. It doesn't really matter. Uh, righties, lefties, they're not going to strike out here, and they're going to make a hell of a lot of contact no matter who's throwing for, for Colorado. So um, 
Of course, a very high upside spot for Houston to outperform their dead neutral uh, 100 WRC plus this season. They're going to hit for some power, and guys like Amo Dubon, Alex Bregman, uh, Kyle Tucker certainly very much in play. Yanir Diaz, 4,400, is you know, probably pretty underpriced. Um, I'd say he'd likely need to be like 47, 4,800. That's probably about value for him in this spot. Chaz McCormick's been great recently at two bombs, I believe, on the Sunday night game. Jeremy Pena still down in the seven hole because he still strikes out at crap load. Still 4,600. That's probably about where he should be at Coors Field at, at least. So I'm not super thrilled about full stacking Houston because I don't really like the lineup, to be quite honest. I don't want to play Jose Abreu, um, you know, at sole first base. He's going to be probably far too popular than his, his numbers really merit just because he's at Coors Field. He kind of sucks. At least his numbers do this season. So it's really like the top three guys, missing Jordan Alvarez and Jose Altuve, um, really takes me off of Houston in a lot of scenarios, even though they still make a lot of contact and are a high upside team. Um, they really got to show it. So if you want to come off of some Houston, given the shenanigans that are likely to go on in the Rockies um, pitching rotation here tonight, I don't think this is bad. Plenty of other offenses here that we could play still, of course, that are similarly priced to Houston, notably the Giants um, and Cincinnati, for example. So I think it's fine to come off of some Houston if you want and not eat a lot of the uh, natural ownership that's going to come to the Astros. Um, Rockies on the other side, they get Hunter Brown and 8,100. I think Hunter Brown's in play, to be quite honest. Now, where he's going to really struggle is that he throws up a lot of a curveball and the curveball isn't very good at sea level. And unfortunately for Hunter Brown, I'm not sure he's going to be able to re fully replace this much of the repertoire uh, coming into Coors Field. If his curveball is not breaking at altitude, I mean, it's certainly not going to at altitude like it will at sea level. Um, if, if it's not breaking at all, he's basically relegated to a, to a two-pitch guy, and that's a four-seamer slider, which gives him a fly ball lean. As a matter of fact, even though he does stay down in the strike zone with the slider, he gets a lot of ground balls on his curveball, too. Doesn't really have a changeup, so it's four-seamer slider, and that's going to give him a far more uh, line drive and fly ball lean than it would you know, the, um, you know, the addition of the curveball, which gives him such heavy, heavy ground ball stuff. That said, uh, his curveball is still going to be serviceable enough, you know, we... It, the Rockies are bad here. This is a bad offense, and they strike out a 24% clip against right-handers. They did just get C.J. Crone back, who strikes out a lot too. Um, Buddy Black is still pretty insistent on playing Jerry Profar up at the top of the lineup for some ridiculous reason. The lineup just doesn't have any upside to hit the baseball over the wall, and when you're eating ownership on, on any Coors Field game, in the Rockies, they don't get as much as they have in, in past seasons with like a story in Arenado um, or anything, but they still get ownership. And when you're eating ownership, like you still need a team to be able to produce like even just a little bit. And in 85 WRC plus they played half of these games against right-handers at Coors field. And the number is still this bad. So um, not overly attractive to be quite honest. And I think that's why Hunter Brown could be in play. But the Rockies are still in play, of course, because he does throw a curveball. He throws a lot of it, so he could just be a two-pitch guy, as I mentioned. Um, and they're cheap, so sure, go ahead. If you want to play some left-handers, I mean, they've only got like two here. It's going to be like a Nolan Jones or a uh, Ryan McMahon. You're not playing Jerry Profar because uh, he doesn't have any upside whatsoever. You're not playing Harold Castro. He's got like one base or extra base hit in the last like three months. Um, so... That's how you want to attack because the ground ball stuff naturally is far lower against the left-handers than it is to the righties. But if you're stacking the Rockies, like, yeah, play Elias Diaz, play C.J. Crone, play Chris Bryant because they're good hitters. Uh, play Zeke Tovar, of course. Um, you know, so not overly thrilling to be going after Hunter Brown because I really like the strikeout stuff and I really like the arm. So I think he's more in play than the Rockies here personally. Yeah, I don't think he's a single-entry sort of punt like that, but if you want to get to some of this in 20 max with some other really popular offenses like San Francisco, uh, I think that's very much in play here. So offense only, um, you know, of course from, from Houston, no pitching from whatever the Rockies are going to do, but I do like a little bit of Hunter Brown here. Uh, okay, let's move on. We're going pretty long. Yankees Angels trying to speed it up a little bit. Domingo Herman, I think he's a little bit pricey here. I want to short him continually. 
um, coming off that perfect game. I really just do not respect Domingo Herman. Uh, I do like the curveball. I do like the changeup, but I do not like the fastball mix here. He throws a break-even two-seamer. He's got a horrible four-seamer. Um, and he still gives up a little bit of pop to really both sides of the plate, more so to right-handers. He's gotten a little bit better with it this season, throwing the righty-righty change a little bit more. That's suppressing some of the contact. He's pretty selective with it. So I like the sequencing, um, but I think overall his numbers this season are performing a little bit outsized to probably where he should be, given how bad the fastball mix is, it. Mix is here. Easy for me to say. Um, curveball, though, is excellent. He mains this pitch. He throws it 40% of the time. It's a really, really good pitch. Um, and I think that could keep him serviceable tonight at 8700 I'm not super jacked about the price. I'd like it if he were like 83 or something, uh, 84 maybe. Um, I think that's a little bit more playable, but it doesn't totally take him out of play in this particular matchup. However, I mean, you really all that comfortable playing anybody against the Angels right now, even without Trout. I mean, Otani is just on some unreal tear right now. It's like Otani is... It, it, he just siphoned all of the 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 juju from the Braves or something. Like, he's just out of control good. Um, and he's 6,400. I think he's about 500 at least underpriced. So I want to play some more Shohei Otani once again, even against a, a really good curveball changeup combination. Um, there's whiffs there, and, and some of these guys from the left side of the plate, Moniak and Otani, are going to strike out. Did just bring up a young Trey Cabbage, dual eligible kind of corner infield piece um he's 2200 you can mix him in with lefties if you want to play platoons i'd rather get to a couple of righties too if i can and that's mixing in a taylor ward zach netto they'll probably lead off again 2800 something like that or a hunter renfro he's perfectly playable and he strikes out about 20 percent clip against righties so um do i want to full stack the angels eh, maybe not uh because like i said i do still kind of respect herman herman's arsenal uh even though i don't really, you know, respect him as a uh, a DFS pitcher a lot of the time. I uh, do kind of have to admit that he is really turning a corner, and the power suppression has been far better this season. Hard contact been far better this season than it it was last year, for example. So um, he's in play for me. Eh, kind of lukewarm on it. I really don't like going after the Angels uh, with Otani up at the top of the line. It just makes them so so difficult. Um, to really attack because really what you've done by taking trout out of the lineups, taking out 30% strikeouts. So uh, it makes them actually a, a lower strikeout upside team for opposing pitchers. So i um, not super thrilled about the price tag. And I want to continue to take shorts on Domingo Herman after that perfect game, even though he was good uh, in a, a start since then, I forget exactly who it was against. Was it the Cubs? Yeah, it was his last start against the Cubs where he went six innings, struck out nine. Um, Angels offense a little bit better there, and they certainly don't have Otani. So uh, Patty Sand Sandoval on the mound for them. I'm going to have to leave him on the on the shelf too. 7,500, he just doesn't throw it past anybody. And I'd, I'd really love to ground balls from Patty, but uh, I, I can't get thrilled with him because he gives up two and three runs every damn outing, and he just doesn't have the floor to get him out of that. From a DFS perspective, he just needs to be cheaper um, in order to realize pretty good upside against the Yankees here. They're still very right-handed heavy and they still produce against righties, despite the fact that their offense has been absolutely atrocious over the last two months since they lost judge 22% strikeout rate though, but still with a 10% walk rate against left-handers 200 ISO, they're going to hit for a lot of power still. And they've got a, some guys like a Harris Bader, DJ LeMay, who's been a little bit better now that he's healthy again. Uh, Volpe's been great over the last, I don't know, two, three weeks. Stanton really starting to heat up. Glaber's been pretty good all season, pretty steady, as a matter of fact. And Ozzy Peraza, who they just brought back, having to put Josh Donaldson on the perpetual DL with the freaking right calf, um, they might lead him off or something tonight. And he, he was on base like five times last night. So uh, he's 2,800, dual eligible second third base. So it's really a tough sell for me here with Patty Sandoval. Because he's not going to throw it past any of these guys, and they're going to go very right-handed heavy. The only lefty they might have on the lineup would be Anthony Rizzo, who is a pest at the plate himself. So, um, you know, pretty difficult sell for me here for Patty. I'm probably just going to leave both of these guys on the shelf for the most part. If I had to choose, it'd be Herman. 
Um, but I'm going to have some Shohei, and you, you better have some of Shohei, and you better have some Mickey Moniak, too, whenever he gets a right-hander. He sees righties very well. Um, and throw in a Taylor Ward if you want to make a you know, short little angel stack or something like that. Hitter's ballpark when it's warm, and it's 80 degrees in L.A. tonight. So I think that's okay going after a little bit of an expensive price tag with Domingo Herman. Okay, let's move on to the last two games of the night here. Minnesota, Seattle, try and keep it short. Um, 9,100 for Bailey Ober. I think he's in play, and I think the market's starting to agree here. 18% ownership so far. Decent value score, pushing 30 for Bailey Ober. Um, unfortunately, 9,100. It's kind of a gross price tag for him. I've got some serious concerns. Number one, he doesn't have any you know, real outsized raw whiffs against the left side of the plate. Just 21.5% K rate there. A lot of fly balls. Um, what what puts him in play a lot of the time is because he's such a heavy fly ball pitcher. Guys make a lot of soft contact and just pop some balls up and they just, you know, they go to the wall um, and they don't really turn into anything. Unfortunately, that doesn't really help us in DFS at a high price tag because we need raw whiffs against, certainly against opposite handed hitters. His biggest problem, however, it's not really to lefties despite the low strikeout rate. It's to right-handers. He gives up a 37% hard contact with the same 050 ground ball to fly ball. That's terrible and super, super concerning with a 180 ISO. He does still get so many ground or so many fly balls rather at 57% raw fly ball rate with just 13% line drives that it does keep him serviceable and it does keep guys from hitting the baseball, you know, just over the wall. Um, but this is very dangerous, and even though it's only translated to 1.4 homers per nine, like this 180 ISO is still a pretty damn attackable figure. He's got a 177 X ISO. So despite the fact of being very good against left-handers with a 100 ISO, the 177 X ISO in aggregate suggests that he's running a little bit hot against the lefties too. And I think that kind of makes sense. If he's not throwing it past a lot of guys, he's going to give up some production there eventually as well. So what that means is I think we're likely to see the 260 ERA drift northward up towards his expected metrics of the 360 X ERA and the 435 XFIP, right? So we're talking about a run and a half, two runs almost of negative regression in the suppression metrics coming to Bailey over. So is he in play? Well, yes, because Seattle is bad. They strike out at a 25, 26% clip against righties. They're just a break-even offense, break-even in every single metric here. So they're very much attackable with a guy that has outsized strikeout stuff to the right side because they're still going to have probably five, maybe even six right-handers in the lineup tonight who are pretty weak generally against right-handed pitching. Julio, sure, at 4,800, his numbers this season – uh, he's striking out a lot. So is Gino, so is Teoscar from the right side of the plate. And those are really their three power bats. Ty France, they've had to relegate him down to the bottom half of the bottom third of the lineup because he hasn't done anything in the two hole this season. And they're still leading off JP Crawford, pretty low upside there. Jared Kelnick, they moved him back up. Um, if he is in the like the three hole or something like that, he's back to 3,600. Now we're talking with him. We don't want him at 5,000. We want him at cheaper price tags. So you could play him and a, maybe a short stack of some Seattle here with like a, you know, always play Julio. When he gets on base, he's still get a steal. Um, so you could play a Julio, a Kelnick, and maybe a Gino Suarez because he's mega cheap at 2,800. Or a Tay Oscar because of the hard contact issues that Bailey Ober exhibits, 37% to the righties and a 9% barrel rate. We've talked about the, this a few times. You want Tay Oscar, in order to realize his upside, you want him against some guys that will, will give up some barrels uh, because he's a very high, very high barrel rate himself. And you can always play Cal Raleigh against a right-hander. So could you squeeze out a stack here of, of Seattle? Yeah, I think it's reasonable. But I think I'd probably prefer, even at an elevated price tag for Bailey Ober, to just get to him. 20% ownership might be a little stiff, I think. Um, I think I'd rather pivot it to Giolito here if I had to choose. But uh, that doesn't mean that Obert's not in play. Brian Wu on the other side for the Mariners. He's definitely in play, too. And you're going to see a ton of ownership come to him. And you really should because Minnesota is garbage as well. 105 WRC plus 27% strikeout rate against right-handers this season. Hit for a little bit more power, but the batted ball profile and plate discipline are average at best here. Um, for the Twins. Now, I do like Eddie Julian at 
3,100. He's fine. Alex Kirilov is still 2,300. It's taken him a little while to get going since he was hurt. Um, but he's 2,300 at first base. I mean, it's kind of hard to ignore that. Do we really want to play Byron Buxton here against Brian Wu in a pretty down matchup? He's got 37% strikeouts. Now, a short sample, yes, but uh, Buxton's going to strike out a crap load in this matchup. Carlos Correa is striking out a lot this season, too. So probably want to stay off of most of Minnesota outside of a cheap Kepler. Hit a bomb last night. Or Joey Gallo, who always has power if he can make contact with the baseball. Um, so it, those are the guys I'd probably target. You know, from the left side, Julian Kirilov and a Joey Gallo, Max Kepler type. If I want to go after and get some leverage on the 30-plus percent ownership of Brian Wu. Probably not going to go out of my way to do that, though, because this game is still in Seattle and Minnesota sucks. So um, give me Brian Wu, and do I want a full 30%? Yeah, maybe not. It's still a young arm here that hasn't really given up a super crooked number um, to memory, at least. Uh, let's see if I can find him uh, over here on the other on the other side. Yeah, I mean, his suppression has been fantastic. Most he's given up so far is two runs in any one outing. Um now, the price tag's continuing to climb, right? He debuted at 5500 or whatever. He's up to 79 It's been a pretty steady price tag climb for him. But this is still a very good matchup. I don't think it's nece necessarily warranted to just jump off the train here because we want to go after Minnesota pretty much every single night. So very little offense here for me and mostly just pitching, I think. Okay, let's get to the last game, Boston and Oakland. Not sure what Boston's going to do. They're going to play their opener shenanigans again. They did it last night with um, Nick Pavetta, who was Cy Pavetta last night somehow. Uh, Chris Murphy, he'll probably only go three innings or so, so you can't really play him against Oakland. Not like you'd want to play a lefty against him necessarily anyway. And certainly not at 6,600. So non-starter here for me. Um, does that mean we want to play some Oakland? You could play some one-off pieces. They brought up uh, another high upside hit tool for them. Uh, high upside you know, for Oakland standards, I suppose. Zach Yeloff at second base. He's cheap, 2,900. Jordan Diaz still at second base as well. you got to choose between those two, but he's 2,300. Brent Rooker still 3,300. Every one of these guys, if you need to get super cheap with a secondary stack or a sec just a one-off piece, you can play some of these cheap middle infield types of pieces or a Brent Rooker or something. Um, Nick Allen's at shortstop. He's 2,100. You know, really good value plays there. But this game is... You know, in 60 degrees in Oakland tonight, pretty hard to realize a lot of raw power upside. So getting there with full stacks of Oakland, even with right-handers, going to be pretty difficult. Probably don't want to do that necessarily. Um, but I think they're very much in play. Brent Rickard's just got to be the favorite. He's got the most raw power upside of anybody here, and he's 3,300. So I think that's playable if you need to land on something like that. So no pitching for Boston here for me. Luis Medina, no pitching here for Oakland for me here either. Um 6,100. Now, he was excellent in his last appearance. It actually was against Boston. He, I'm not sure, I can't remember off the top of my head if he came out of the bullpen or if they used him as a traditional starter. I think he was a traditional starter, even though sometimes this season they have used him out of the bullpen um, to really calm the uh, the strike one and walk problems. Um, you know, like he's got some serious contact issues to right to the righties. 37% uh, hard contact, 262 ISO allowed, walks to both sides, 11.5% in aggregate, and really concerning numbers, super, super attackable. Not all that much better against left-handers, 12% walks there, and a 175 ISO north of that with just an 18% strikeout rate there. Um, this game is in Oakland, and like I said, it is 60 degrees. If you are counting on... Medina having back-to-back -back good starts or good appearances against the same team that he just saw a week ago in his last appearance, uh, you know, go ahead. Pavetta just did it last night, but Pavetta is, well, Pavetta got Oakland, and Medina, however, gets Boston, right? So it's a little bit of a different dynamic there. Um, so do you want to play Boston? I don't really want to play him at full stacks, to be honest, because it's in Oakland. It's 60 degrees, and it's kind of a break-even offense, so I'd rather get to other offenses in full stacks, but most of these guys are still very playable. Devers is 5,000. This is a steal price tag for him against pretty much everybody. Uh, Yoshida at, at 4,300. Same thing with him. He has a 12% strikeout rate. You play him against everybody. And Jaron Duran is okay at 3,600 too. I don't really want to pay a normal price tag for Justin Turner here tonight necessarily. Um, Alex Verdugo, same sort of deal, normal price tag. Adam Duvall down to 4,300. We're starting to see a depressed strikeout or a depressed uh, price tag for him, rather. 
Um, he doesn't strike out a lot is where my brain was going. So I think it's okay. You could convince me that a full five-man Boston stack is in play, but really not my favorite. Um, not that I respect a hell of a lot of Luis Medina or anything like that. I, is he another one of these guys down in the 6K range that you could land on? I, I mean, there's probably worse plays that you could make. Um, not many, but uh, I, I think he's in play just because he's 6,100. He does still have some suppression against the right side in terms of swing and miss. Uh, it's just that he's got to stop walking people. So um, that's what takes him out, out of play for me. But um, 6,100 kind of does have to put him in play. It's super low ownership. So I have to keep an eye. They might bring him out behind an opener or something because it is back-to-back -back appearances against Boston for him. So that's kind of how I'd like to approach this game. A little bit of Boston, mostly short stacks, I, I think. Um, no pitching pretty much at all. I, I think maybe a one-off here or there from the Athletics. Okay, that's it for the breakdown. Went kind of long, of course, but 14 games, kind of hard to not go long. Cleveland-Pittsburgh, let's go over a review real quick. Logan Allen and Mitch Keller think both of these guys are in play here. I'm going to stay off of offense for the most part. Uh, however, I do really like Connor Joe tonight. He's one of the best plays of the day uh, in my estimation, and I like Kutch as well. Um, so you could play Henry Davis or Brian Reynolds too if you want. No Cleveland. I'm just going to stay off of it. I don't want to go after Mitch Keller. Um Dodgers, Baltimore, really like offense here. No pitching at all. No Michael Grove. I think he is a bullpen arm. And unfortunately, they just need him in a rotation. Um, Tyler Wells, he is a rotation arm, but he's got a real serious homer problem. So give me all of the offense that I can get in this game and no pitching whatsoever. San Diego, Toronto. Um, I'm going to stay off of pitching here, too. I don't want to touch Alec Manoa. I think he's bad. And um, I never thought he was all that good, to be honest. Uh, Joe Musgrove, I think he's just too expensive for this particular matchup. Even though I do kind of respect the arm here, not necessarily against righties. He's got a really good cutter, so I want more lefty handy, lefty heavy lineups um, against uh, Joe Musgrove, or, or if I'm considering playing Joe, Joe Musgrove. Um, and Toronto is certainly not that. So uh, do I want to play offense? No, not really. I, I want to play some San Diego, I think, and, and take some shorts against Alec Mano. I just Let's let's cool it on the um, you know eight strikeout game against Detroit, San Francisco, Cincinnati. Offense only, of course, against Luke Weaver and Anthony DiScalfani. Um, play everybody, play whoever, uh, and play as much of them as you can. There should probably be a lot of runs scored in this game tonight. White Sox, Mets. I like Giolito, maybe a White Sox piece here or there, but man, Cookie Carrasco might really be in play here tonight. I mean, this is kind of gross. Um, I really don't want to do this, but I think he kind of has to be in play here. He's just kind of by default the best option of anybody down in this range. Uh, Mets, yeah, Pete Alonso at 4,800 because he's Pete Alonso and he's 4,800. But uh, lefties is who I mostly want against Giolito, and I don't really want anybody else. Maybe a Brandon Nimmo? I mean, I guess. Um, Arizona, Atlanta, Atlanta definitely, but Arizona too in full stacks, I think. Atlanta mostly short stacks for me. I want nothing to do with Bryce Elder. I think we still need to see some price tag and some production regression come to him. So I'm going to stay off of that, I think. And I don't play pitchers for the most part against Arizona. Zach Davies, absolutely not. Um, but you could come off of Atlanta because he does still get some ground balls. It's not totally out of the uh, realm of possibility here. Miami, St. Louis. I've been kind of on Miami a good bit recently. I'm going to go right back to Georgie Soler. I'm not going to play any Eddie Cabrera because I think he's overpriced and he walks too many people. Um... Jordan Montgomery, I'm going to stay off of this too because he is very likely to, um, very likely to see about eight right-handers, maybe even nine right-handers tonight. So at 8,200, I think it may be a little pricey for that. Tampa, Texas, uh, no pitching here for me. Eovaldi just because he's expensive. Taj because he gets Texas, and well, Eovaldi, you know, I would consider playing him against Tampa, um, you know, if it were not for the price tag, I guess. But, yeah, I wouldn't be happy about it. So really offense only here for me, but these guys are expensive. I'd rather play the Dodgers. I'd rather play some Atlanta um, if I had to choose, but that makes these guys really good tournament plays. Very, very good offenses here. Washington and the Cubs. Corbin, I guess, uh, gross. Same thing with Tyon, but I really don't want it. Like, this is a bad matchup for both of these teams, I think. Better matchup for Corbin. Yeah, it's kind of nasty against the Cubs. Because they do have some righties here that are at very cheap price tags. And he gives up a lot of production to right-handers still. Um, Washington, though, definitely. I want to play some left-handers against Tyon. He's got horrible splits against lefties. And he's coming off a really, really good outing against the Yankees. I don't think that's really who Tyon is anymore. 
Detroit and Kansas City. Tarek Skubal here, uh, I like a good bit here in the mid-range. Um, Daniel Lynch, I guess, maybe, if you want to just, like, throw up and, you know, go to the bar or something. Um, or go to the bar and then throw up, whatever you want to do. Either way, Daniel Lynch is, is not going to be um, you know, very thrilling to be playing tonight. But he's in play because he's 6,300. Offensive pieces, probably just one-offs here for me against um, Daniel Lynch for Detroit. But you can... Get to some short stacks like a um, a Torque, Andy Abanez, mix in one of the catchers, something like that, a Veerling up top, something. I think that's okay. Um, probably no Kansas City here for me. Bobby Witt, 44, you can always play that. But um, outside of that, I mean, no thanks. Offense stinks. Houston, Colorado, offense definitely. Hunter Brown, I think, is in play in, as well. Um, Houston, sure, but you can come off of that if Colorado just runs a bullpen game here. The offense is not all that impressive. Not all that impressive. And bullpen games are bullpen games. You you know, you, you see some offenses struggle in bullpen games sometimes. Uh, whatever the Rockies are doing on the mound, absolutely no for me. I'm probably just going to stay off of most of them in the batter's box, too. Um, I, even though, you know, Hunter Brown might struggle here with the uh, sort of deletion, if you will, of his curveball. Uh, Yankees, Angels, Domingo herman has got to be in play in the 8K range. I'd rather pivot it up to Giolito or down to Tarek Skubal, personally, um, and play Otani. But uh, I think he's in play because he does still have some whiffs. And the Angels overall, having, even though they're losing a lot of strikeouts in Trout, um, they're still losing Trout. I mean, Trout's still Trout. So Patty Sandoval on the mound for the Angels. I just can't do it against probably eight right-handers here that the Yankees are going to throw out. Uh, I think you get some maybe fishy Yankee stacks here, play a... Uh, and Ozzy Peraza, Stanton, Bader, you know, mix in really whoever you want. Volpe, I think, is okay. You need guys to get it in the air because Patty still does induce a lot of ground balls. Minnesota, Seattle, Bailey Ober, and Brian Wu both in play for me. Just short stacks or one-off pieces as leverage on the other side, but mostly just pitching here for me. Boston and Oakland, uh, mostly just short Boston pieces, one-off of Oakland here or there. No pitching whatsoever. So that's it. We are done here. Uh, good luck to everybody on the Big 14-game main here on uh, Tuesday, 18 July. Uh, we'll once again have ownership and projection updates pushed to the site all throughout the day, so keep an eye out for all of that. Good luck.